Hi, I'm Alex Lamb and you're watching the sixth and final episode in my thrilling series on group selection. So congratulations ladies and gents for coming with me on this extraordinary journey. We, we are attempting to overturn decades of evolutionary biology research with nothing but some slightly shoddily written computer software in a vaguely unfashionable language thrown together by somebody who isn't even a professional scientist, but who is, nevertheless, the writer of some extremely readable science fiction novels that kind of blend space opera and hard science fiction together, you should almost certainly go and seek out at your local bookshop. But that's entirely beside the point. This video is about the conclusions. This is about what we've learned on our exciting journey. This is about what we now know that we didn't when we commenced on our voyage. Well, what we have shown is that group selection can happen. We've seen it happen. So saying that it can't happen is wrong. So I'm sorry, Richard Dawkins, but in this particular regard, the P Wilson and his chums, they, they kind of have a point. Group selection is a real thing. It can take place. But I'm sure if, if, if uh, the uh, extraordinary Professor Dawkins was here in the room with me, what he would do is he would lower his spectacles like this and give me a, a long, cold stare over the top of his glasses. And he would say to me, that doesn't prove, sir, that it happens in nature. And he would be absolutely right. He would be he will be on top of his game, ladies and gents, because we haven't proved that. We don't know that at all. All we've done is demonstrate that it can happen in a simulation. But here's something that I think is important. Every explanation that we come up with is a model. It doesn't matter whether or not you're talking about some clever equations that have been scrawled on the blackboard of some incredibly prestigious university or somebody wearing the most magnificent bow tie you've ever seen sitting in an armchair, sort of delivering some great and highly convincing statement about what is truth. Um, somebody with all kinds of letters after their name, pretty much the whole alphabet just repeated twice. Um, my point is that without experimental data, there is no spoon. The only way we can nose towards truth is by doing these kinds of studies, by everybody taking a look, by attempting to explore and ex experiment and unpack what actually happens. And in actual fact, in denying that something like group selection could possibly happen, we have been handed a science gift because that's something we can actually test with simulations. If somebody says, you can never have X, and we go, ah ha ha, and then you go and look to see whether or not you can make X. Because that at some level tells us if X does exist, it puts constraints on the circumstance in which it can actually happen. And another thing about computer models is that software sims are open I can share my code. It's relatively easy to read. I have I have a little class file for, for my agent, another one for what does a tribe look like. People can pick their way through it and understand exactly what's going on at some kind of intuitive level. And then they can turn to me and say, you failed to compensate for childhood or whatever it is. And then, and then we can go to crazy nerd town. They can write a copy, they can write a simulation for themselves and we can compare it with what it does to mine and that we can that we can write all kinds of snippy remarks at each other online about the fact that people didn't comment their code well enough. But you, you get the general idea. Building simulations, sharing them with each other, we can all engage in the process of pushing the frontiers of human knowledge. So what can we say now, ladies and gents? From having gone on this journey, what can we say from this simulation about group selection? Well, we can ask the question, when does it happen? Given that we've shown that it can happen, when does that actually take place? Well, it happens when tribes can die due to collective fitness. And remember what I mean by a tribe here is any group of agents or animals or people who are tightly coupled enough that they are living or dying together. So why might people die in unison? Well, maybe they're farmers and one particular tribe has a horrible infestation of nasty blight on their crops and all of their wheat fall over and they're all like, oh, feed me, and then they have no pie. Uh, it could be that. Or alternatively, it could be that they're having a nice life and a whole bunch of Scotsmen paint themselves blue and and from the next valley over and race down the hillside going oh like this and slaughter absolutely everybody. I'm not necessarily picking out the Scots here as responsible for murdering tribes, but 
Scotsman. Anyway, you get the general idea. Or, alternatively, it could be that a particular tribe uh, becomes infected with one disease. Maybe one of these sinister viral organisms that looks like an icosahedron on stilts um, ravages their lungs. Uh, and everybody, everybody's dying like that. It could be sound to something like that. But it's also important to notice that this happens not just when death is synchronized, but when reproduction is cheap. When reproduction isn't cheap, none of this stuff can take place. So that's an important thing to remember. And we can also ask the question, why does it happen? Why does something like group selection happen in nature? Because at some level, that's really the mystery. That's, that's what these scientists have been battling over. Because at some level, it didn't look like there was any possible mechanism. But what we can say now is that group selection happens when collective outcomes matter. When, that, when collective outcomes matter, genes stop caring what bodies they're in, so long as they are tightly bound enough to coordinate. So what that means is if you stuff a bunch of people together into one community and synchronise the way in which they're dying, you've got enough incentive for the genes living in that community to forget the fact that they are happen to be in a bunch of different bodies rather than one body, they'll coordinate anyway, because that's what affords them genetic advantage. Extraordinary though that is, you can also ask yourself the question, how come genes, which are really just little kind of mini nuggets of proteiny goodness, how come they're able to coordinate in the first place? They think about it, they don't, they're inanimate, they don't have any agency, and yet they can, they can work together within an individual body to achieve the most extraordinary things. Why shouldn't it be the case that they're also coordinating between separate bodies when those bodies are forced into a situation in which they have to operate together? Well, we've demonstrated that that's exactly what takes place. So at some level, Professor Dawkins should be glad because we've not only demonstrated that it can happen, but also that his idea that genes are paramount in this business, he's absolutely right. Genes are paramount. Genes are selfish. But genes don't particularly care that they're in body A or body B. They'll just do whatever it is that's going to net them a win. But can we be certain, ladies and gents? No, never completely, because screwing up happens. Perhaps with the simulation, we don't know what we think we've learned. There's always room for doubt. Perhaps we're asking the wrong questions. And the nice thing about this process is by building your own simulation, you can push closer to the truth. Have I convinced you, ladies and gents? Do you now believe that group selection is a possible thing, or do you still doubt it? If you do, I challenge you to tell me why, and I also encourage you to write a simulation of your own. Do you know JavaScript? Do you know Python? Have you ever had to build a website for somebody? Maybe you already have the tools to find out the truth about where goodness comes from in nature, or other exciting and equally chewy, weighty, and philosophical subjects. So that's my main point here, ladies and gents. What do you think? Are you going to trust blindly or are you going to test to reality? Science is healthier when we are all engaged, when we all exercise playful, rational scepticism. And we all sort of say, I'm not convinced by his argument. And then you go away and you do your own thing and then we have a conversation about it. Because there are a lot of people who are doing science careers right now who are having a kind of a sucky time. Science has drifted off and become this thing where some people are scientists and they live in a university and they do their research and everyone else kind of just sort of takes it for granted. Why are we doing that? Why are we participating? Why are not we challenging these results and asking questions for ourselves? Everyone who owns a laptop has the opportunity to reach the frontier of human knowledge. And what are we doing? Mostly looking at cat pictures, frankly. We can do better than that, ladies and gents. We definitely can. Anyway, I'm hoping that this is the first in a series of exciting video episode -y things in which I'm going to try and build more simulations, some of which even with a more science fictional flavour to them, we're not only going to explore the truth about how human beings interact with each other, how economics works, what makes societies function, but also we're going to attempt to push forward into the future and discover what these exact sort of simulations might say about the future of the human race. So that's it for now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming with me on this journey. My name is Alex Lamb, and I write science fiction novels. These ones, in fact. 
So if you've enjoyed this journey, why not try the books? And also tune in next time for another thrilling simulation adventure. You've been awesome for watching this far.